Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, another episode of Harris County Master Gardeners and the Green Thumb, uh, partnering up with the Harris County Public Library. Um, we're very excited. We have got an amazing show for you today, of course, because it is the third Tuesday of the month. And the third Tuesday of every month is when we uh, have our Green Thumb Gardening Series. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about pollinator gardening. Uh, we've got a very special show. Uh, a couple of quick announcements before we get going. We're going to remind everybody that next month, um, we are going to be talking about fall vegetable gardening, and that's going to be on July 18th. So go ahead and mark your calendars now for fall vegetable gardening, uh, July 18th. Um, also, we are going to be taking lots and lots of questions. If you have questions throughout the presentation today, please uh, type those into the Facebook comment, se Facebook comment section or uh, uh, however you're watching this. Uh, just go ahead and uh, uh, type those in. We also will be recording this so it will be available so you can watch it again later on. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce our uh, very special host. Uh, Ms. Deborah Caldwell was a professor of biology, uh, environmental science, and uh, agroecology at a community college college in California for over 30 years. Um, she is now a Harris County Master Gardener and has an advanced certificate in entomology. She's a lifelong gardener with many years of experience growing ornamentals and vegetables. How are you doing, Deborah? I'm fine. Thank you for the introduction, John. You're more than welcome. Uh, I'm excited about this one because I definitely, um, I've noticed uh, one thing I happen to have in my yard is a lot of wasps. Um, I don't know if those are pollinators, but I'd maybe like to attract some other ones other than just wasps and mosquitoes. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to let you enlighten us. Tell you what, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put your presentation up here. Then I'm going to slip out and I'll let you get started. And uh, we will pause once again, remind everybody we will be pausing for questions about halfway through. And then, uh, of course, at the end. So please get those questions and type in. And without further ado, Deborah, uh, the floor is yours. OK, well, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Um, we are going to uh, have several more lectures in our Green Thumb series. As John mentioned, in uh, July, we have fall vegetable gardening coming up. So I hope you'll join us then. And we have several more very interesting talks coming up, ending in October with uh, trees and tree care. If you're interested in pollinator gardening, um, you may want to come out to a special workshop that we're having this Saturday, starting at nine o'clock at General Friendship Gardens. And uh, you can learn how to grow and care for pollinator plants that thrive in Houston. And each participant will be given a pollinator plant to take home. So I hope you can join us uh, this Saturday or come by some other time and visit at General Friendship Gardens. So today we're going to be talking about the role of pollinators and describe some of the different types and the flowers they like to pollinate. And of course, we'll also explain how to attract pollinators to your garden. But let's begin by uh, talking a little bit about what pollination actually is. What happens is that pollen grains are moved from the anther uh, on the male part of the flower to the stigma, the sticky top of the female part of another flower. Sometimes this can happen in the same flower, usually it's another flower, sometimes on a completely different plant. The dilemma is, how does the pollen get moved from the anther to the stigma? Some plants use water, uh, many use wind. Uh, if you think about grasses and some kinds of trees that have relatively small flowers, they often expose them to the wind and the wind carries the pollen through the air to another plant, much to the dismay of um, allergy sufferers. If you see a bright, colorful, showy flower with a lot of nectar, um, it may also be quite fragrant, that flower is probably pollinated by some sort of animal. Animals that are pollinators include birds, bats, and many different types of insects. Like you see here in the photo, this is a moth that's a pollinator. In our area, we don't usually have bats acting as pollinators, but if you go to the desert south southwest, you may see cacti, for example, that have big white flowers that open at night 
and those are often pollinated by bats or moths. Hummingbirds are major pollinators as well as many kinds of insects. Hummingbirds tend to have long bills and tongues and they're most attracted to red, yellow and orange flowers that are tubular. Uh, in these photos, you can see the hummingbirds are hovering as they drink the nectar, but um, if they do perch, they need a fairly strong perch. Uh, we think of them as being tiny, but they're bigger than the insects. In these kinds of flowers, you're often going to see the male and female parts of the flowers stick out as the hummingbird feeds, the top of its head or the back of its neck may be dusted with pollen, and then it moves on to another flower. It will um, have a, a female part of the flower that also sticks out and receives the pollen. In our area, we have many different types of hummingbird species that go through and some live here almost year round. Uh, you might see ruby-throated hummingbirds migrating from August through October, and then again in March through May. We do have a few that overwinter. So this is a great time to get your garden ready for the hummingbirds that may be passing through. You can get plants in the ground now that may be blooming by August when the migration starts. You may also see rufous hummingbirds. These are cute little hummingbirds that um, have green wings, but overall they have sort of an orange or rusty uh, color on their bodies. They often go through October through March. Um, we do have black chinned hummingbirds fairly commonly in the winter. They look quite a bit like ruby throated hummingbirds, but the main difference is that the black throated hummingbirds have sort of a almost purplish uh, throat patch, whereas the ruby throated hummingbirds, as the name tells us, have, have more of a red color. Other winter species that you might see include Allen's and Anna's hummingbirds broad-tailed or buff-bellied hummingbirds as well. Insects are major pollinators and their mouth parts determine the kinds of flowers they pollinate. You'll often find bees, beetles, and flies on fairly flat flowers. Bees, beetles, flies, wasps, and some of the smaller butterflies like skippers often will be found on umbels. These are plants that have a, a flower spike that looks almost like an umbrella, like Queen's Anne's lace or carrots or parsley. Um, as we mentioned, tubular flowers are often pollinated by hummingbirds, but also sometimes by butterflies and moths. Bees sometimes cheat by chewing into the base of the flower to get the nectar if they can't get into a skinny tubular kind of flower. Now you may not think of beetles as being pollinators, but some are. Um, beetles don't fly very well because they have um, fairly bulky bodies and only one set of functional wings, but they can fly and they prefer flowers that have sort of a bowl shape so they can land and then climb around. Um, and as they're moving around inside the flower to get the nectar, they will uh, pick up pollen from exposed male and female, uh, exposed male parts, and then transfer it to the female parts. They aren't that um, attracted to bright, showy flowers, but tend to be more attracted to flowers that are white or kind of a dull cream color or even greenish. They do like flowers that smell like fruit, that are open during the day, and have moderate amounts of nectar. Flies also pollinate quite a bit. Uh, some of them, in fact, look almost like bees. You have to look very closely to see the difference. Um, they tend to be attracted to flowers that uh, have bright colors and lots of nectar, like sunflowers, but some are attracted to flowers that smell like feces or rotten meat. Uh, if you think of a corpse flower or stapelia, uh, which has sort of a brown speckled flower that almost looks like flesh, um, those are probably pollinated by flies. Butterflies, skippers, and moths, of course, are major pollinators. They have a complete life cycle, meaning that an egg will be laid, 
It will develop into larvae. We usually call them caterpillars. Then they go through uh, metamorphosis. They pupate and go through metamorphosis and then they emerge as adults. So we have to keep their life cycle in mind because we wanna make sure we provide food for both the larvae who have chewing mouth parts and for the adults who have their long coiled proboscis that they use to suck nectar from flowers. All of these animals belong to the order Lepidoptera and they all have scales on their wings and some are very showy like the fritillary that we see in this photo. Moths tend to be more active at night. So the flowers they're attracted to are often white or a light color so they can see them at night. Whereas butterflies are more active in the daytime. So the flowers they're attracted to often have bright colors and provide a lot of nectar. Um, they will often have very large, deep nectaries, and they may have nectar guides, which are patterns or lines on the flower that help direct the pollinator towards the nectary. You may not see these nectar guides. Uh, some of them are only visible in ultraviolet light, which the insects can see. So you may see something that just looks like a plain yellow flower, but in fact, under UV light, you'll see that it has pretty elaborate uh, nectar guides. Butterflies often do like um, flowers that are in clusters and provide a landing uh, platform of some sort. So we mentioned they like um, the umbellifery family flowers um, that have uh, the umbrella shape and, and do provide a landing platform. And then, of course, bees are also major pollinators. They prefer flowers that are full of nectar and pollen. Uh, they like flowers that are bright. Uh, they really prefer blues and yellows. Um, they're active in the daytime. Again, they like landing platforms. Now, as I mentioned, some bees can pollinate tubular flowers. If you have a flower like a foxglove that's big enough for the bee to get its little body in, then it can go inside and, and reach the nectary. But um, very skinny tubular flowers still could be pollinated by bees. Well, we shouldn't say they pollinate them because they actually cheat. Uh, as I mentioned, they'll go to the um, base of the flower where the nectary is located and chew a little hole and uh, suck the nectar from the hole. So that sort of thwarts the flower's plan to get pollinated. Bees are among the most ideal pollinators for a variety of reasons. One is that they spend most of their time collecting pollen uh, to feed their larvae. And of course they use the nectar to make honey. They're also quite fuzzy. They have little hairs all over their bodies, which pick up and carry a lot of pollen. And many bees also have stiff hairs on their back legs, which helps to store the pollen in sacs. In the previous photo, you can see a bee that has a full pollen sac on its back legs. So bees are among the major pollinators. In Texas, we have six native bee families comprising over a thousand native bee species, and most of them are solitary bees. When we think of bees, we usually think of honeybees, which are social insects and live in colonies and have specific roles. But among our native bees, most are solitary and live by themselves. Uh, you may find aggregations of these kinds of native bees. Um, they just happen to be living in the same area because there are good conditions, but they're not cooperating. Uh, they're not truly social insects. Many of our native bees live in the ground, um, although some live in cavities like in wood. So let's highlight a few of our native bee species. Um, I'll start with the little green and blue bee, which is a helicted bee. It's sometimes called a sweat bee because they're attracted to sweat in order to get salt. These little bees are gorgeous because they have the blue and green coloration and they're often kind of a shiny metallic um, color. 
Then we have several bees in the Apidae family, including carpenter bees, which you see uh, is the dark bee next to the kind of purplish pink flower. And carpenter bees are fairly large bees. Um, they tend to uh, use buzz pollination where they'll land on a flower and then vibrate. This helps knock the pollen grains down onto their body so they can carry them. Um, below that, you can see a bumblebee, which is also quite a large bee. They also use buzz pollination. Um, bumblebees are very, very effective pollinators. They um, have, um, in fact, been shown to visit twice as many flowers as a honeybee in the same amount of time. And they're big bees, so they can carry a lot of pollen and nectar at any given time. The yellowish bee that you see is a plasterer bee. They get their name because they um, often chew up plants or um, use mud and, and put sort of a plaster in their um, cavities. We should also mention a couple of other bees that aren't pictured here. Um, in the Megachylidae family, we have a couple of bees, including leafcutter bees and also mason bees. Mason bees are very, very hard workers. They're much more efficient pollinators than honeybees, in fact, and are often preferred by people who have orchards. Um, so the native bees in Texas are very important pollinators, in addition to our old friend, the European honeybee. These bees were imported into uh, our continent in the 17th century, and they have become extremely important pollinators for many of our crops. Um, they're preferred by beekeepers because they are social bees, and they live in large colonies in hives, and they can be transported pretty easily. Um, you'll often see beekeepers uh, taking hives to uh, <clears throat> excuse me, into one crop uh, to pollinate that, and then they'll move um, through the season to other crops. And um, they're very important in helping uh, grow crops that we use for food. About a third of the, the food we eat is pollinated by bees. So I think I'll stop here and see if we have any questions yet. Yes, yes, of course, <laughs> we oh, do. Hey. Uh, um, uh, first off, I, I had no idea about solitary bees. I thought all bees were all in the hive and that's where they all stayed. And, uh, uh I guess my question is on that. So is there any, I mean, is there anything we can do to, um, like encourage more solitary, more of the bees? I mean, obviously you can't, uh, I, you can't have a, not everybody can be a beekeeper and have hives of bees, bees in their backyard, but, is there, you said they live in the ground and uh, I'm worried about like mowing the grass. Does that, you know, bother them or where, I, you know, is there anything we could do to help, uh, um, uh, help the solitary bees or, you know, have them more. Oh, food? absolutely. We're going to talk a lot more about okay. how to attract pollinators to your yard. But one thing you can do is to have a bare area, just oh, okay. mud, which isn't covered by plants or grass or uh, mulch. And, and that would be a good spot for them to go down into the ground. See that bear, that bear spot in my yard. That's that's what that'll be for now. That's a... exactly. <laughs> um, I had another question for you about hummingbirds. So uh, this came into us. So obviously the hummingbird feeders that everybody's got, they're hanging in their yard. They got the red liquid and they attract the hummingbirds. Do does having a hummingbird feeder that you're putting the liquid in does it? Is it like um, taking away the competition of the plants? I mean, is it is the hummingbirds? Were they going to go? Should we not be doing that to attract hummingbirds? Or is that it will will that be where all the hummingbirds go and not they'll avoid the plants? Well, it doesn't hurt to give them hummingbird food um, in a in a a feeder. Um, the one time you might be cautious about doing that is if it's time for them to migrate. Okay. It's probably better for them to go ahead and migrate rather than hang around because, of course, as we learn, the temperatures can get very, very, very cold. And um, some species can survive, but some of them would have a very hard time. Uh, I remember finding a little hummingbird that had um, gone down under some uh, row covers to try to shelter in my vegetable garden and unfortunately didn't make it. So mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's better to scoot them along and, and send them off on their migration. Um, speaking of feeders though, you never want to put the red food coloring in the water. Okay. Uh, 
that that's not necessary. They'll still come to the feeder. And in fact, the red food coloring can be harmful to them. Oh, that's um, good to know. So you just want um, a mixture of uh, granulated sugar. You don't want to use mm -hmm. brown sugar or honey or any other sweetener. Just pure granulated sugar boiled um, in water. And the ratio should be one part sugar to four parts water. Great. Good news. Okay. Hummingbird feeder is good, but only at the right time of the year. Um, now, you also mentioned moths, uh, how moths were uh, pollinators. Now, obviously, I didn't think about it, but when we have the, you know, the porch light on, obviously, we've got tons of moths that are coming around. Do they, will they be doing any pollinating at night or is that only during the day? Or I mean, do they, I see them at night. Obviously, that's when they come out. But um, when the light goes off, or does the light hurt help or any way? I mean, should we put a light, should I put a big bright light in the garden? <laughs> No, no, they're um, probably better off without the light. Uh, they will find the, the flowers that they're going to pollinate at night. And as I mentioned, they're usually very light colored white. They may be fragrant, okay. um, but they'll find them. Um, and that's when they're most active. So that's when they do most of their pollination. No idea. Well, okay, we did have one other question come in. It looks like it said someone asked if there was an AgriLife or a Harris County Master Gardeners resource for bees. And I believe there someone answered that there was this. Of course, we have some Harris County Master Gardeners in the uh, in the chat section right now. So feel free to do that. And I think we're going to, they will be answering that. Unless you happen to know, Deborah, on the website, the Harris County Master Gardener website, if there's a resource uh, for bees. I don't know specifically, but maybe somebody can put in a link. We'll do that. We'll keep doing that. Well, let's get back to it. I'll let you get on it, Devin. We'll come back okay. and do uh, wrap up with some more questions. But until then, the, once again, this floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, of course, this is the big question. Like John wanted to know, how do you attract pollinators to your garden? So um, we need to keep in mind several things. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we need to make sure we have food for different parts of their life cycle food for the larvae and for the adults. We want to be sure to provide water and shelter. And also we want to minimize or eliminate the use of pesticides that will kill them. So we're also going to be talking about IPM, integrated pest management. So let's start uh, by talking a little bit about how to plan your garden, how to choose flowers that uh, pollinators prefer. Um, first of all, when you plan your garden, you wanna make sure that it's in an area that isn't exposed to too much wind because these little animals are small and can really get battered by a lot of wind. Um, generally, you're going to be planting in areas that have partial to full sun uh, because the kinds of plants that attract pollinators that have flowers are probably going to prefer partial to full sun. Um, and you want to, um, plant in drifts or clusters of flowers of the same type uh, to make it easier for the pollinators to find them. Uh, so rather than having a zinnia here and a zinnia eight feet away and another zinnia 10 feet away, put them all together so they create a big show and make it easier for the pollinator to find them. And then of course, it's very important to choose plants that are well adapted to Harris County. So I want to mention two great resources. One is the Texas Superstar website. Um, you can see a link there, and I think they're going to put it in the chat so you can copy and paste. Um, Texas Superstars are plants that thrive in Texas. They love it here. They love the heat, and they do very, very well. So if you go to this website, you can get a list of plants that have been classified as Texas superstars. And um, it's arranged by um, annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and so on. So you can um, find the kind of plant you're looking for. And when you click on a plant, you'll uh, get all sorts of information about it. Um, growth habit and whether what kind of light requirements it has, water requirements, that kind of thing. And also a lot of uh, very pretty photos so you can get an idea of whether it's the kind of plant you want. I've noticed that a lot of nurseries now are creating sections exclusively for the Texas superstars. So it makes it easier to find them. Another great website is Earthkind Landscaping and um, this is just a fantastic resource with information about 
water conservation and mulch and just about anything you need to know about gardening. But one of my favorite features of the website is the Earthkind plant selector. Um, what you can do is go to the selector, type in your zip code to get your region, and then it will give you a form to fill out um, where you can list the kinds of characteristics you want. So let's say we want a shrub that is evergreen and blooms in the spring. Um, we hit select or search and uh, it will generate a whole list of plants that meet those criteria. And you um, will find that they're rated, 10 being the best, down to zero. So usually I just stick with the nines and tens because I know those are plants that are gonna thrive in this area. And again, I can go to each plant and get much, much more information about it and also see a lot of photos. So between these two great websites, um, it's they're great tools for finding plants for your garden. Now you do want to try to provide a seasonal sequence of flowers so that you're providing food for pollinators year round. Um, Many of us tend to go to the nursery in the spring and we load up on plants and plant those in our garden. And then by fall, there's nothing blooming. Um, so it's a good idea to really plan um, kind of a seasonal sequence to provide food for the pollinators that are migrating uh, through or for those who stay here year round. So let's go through the seasons and mention a couple of plants that will be blooming during different times of the year. So starting in the winter, you might uh, plant uh, Carolina jessamine, or in the photo, you can see flowering quince. Um, this is a gorgeous plant that blooms um, you know, late winter. And then in springtime, some good choices would be coral honeysuckle, columbine, it's another good one, and salvia. Uh, in the photo, you can see the Henry Dulberg salvia, which was uh, named um, for Henry Dulberg's gravesite. They found this in a cemetery, and it had been growing for many, many years. I have this in my garden in a spot that gets um, part sun, and it still grows like crazy, produces a lot of beautiful purple flowers. It's heat tolerant, and it just blooms and blooms and blooms pretty much from spring through frost. The salvias keep going in the summer and fall as well. Um, other plants that you might consider for summer and fall include bougainvillea. Uh, pentas are great uh, pollinator flowers. Uh, Turk's cap, lantana. Um, in the photo, you can see new gold lantana, which is um, a Texas superstar and attracts all the pollinators, especially butterflies. To keep the show going, you can plant um, zinnias. And really with zinnias, you could probably have two crops of zinnias. I usually start some and put them out in the springtime and they're going strong right now. And then I'll probably start some more seeds um, to replace them um, as they start to, to get tattered. Um, many of them will recede. So, um, but keep in mind, you can have flowering plants just about any time of the year. We're very fortunate to live in this area and have that advantage. You want to have a lot of diversity in your garden. Um, have plants with uh, different heights. So everything ranging from ground covers through shrubs and trees. Uh, plant flowers that have different shapes. As we mentioned, different kinds of pollinators are going to prefer flowers with different shapes. So you might have the bowl shape for the beetles, a nice flat flower for some bees and um, flies, and then some tubular flowers for the butterflies and hummingbirds. Different colors, different scents. The greater diversity of plants you have, the greater diversity of pollinators you'll have. Um, it's a great idea also to plant flowers next to your vegetable garden and your fruit trees because that will attract the pollinators who pollinate those plants as well and will increase your yield. Here in the photo, the red flower is Turk's cap. And this is a, a great plant 
that uh, attracts a lot of pollinators um, and it will do well in partial shade. I have a very shady yard, so I'm always looking for plants that flower even in the shade. And then in the other side, you can see um, Vitex. Um, that forms a, a small tree or Mexican buckeye would be another one that will um, provide flowers. You also want to tend to stick with the old fashioned varieties. Um, try to avoid the newer flowers that maybe double or um, have odd shapes that make it difficult for pollinators to feed or in some cases, totally lack pollen and nectar. So in the photo, you can see Echinacea purpurea, the species on one side with two bees on top. And then you can see a hybrid that's been developed that um, has double flowers and they're so tight, it's almost impossible for the pollinators to reach the nectar. So they may be pretty, but they're not really going to help the pollinators. Tend to stick with the older varieties. As we mentioned, it's important to provide food for the different life stages. Um, with butterflies, for example, the uh, larvae or caterpillar eats completely different food from the adult. And as a result, it helps the population grow ever larger because the adults aren't competing with the, uh, the larval forms. So you may find that some kinds of caterpillars can feed on a wide variety of plants, but many of them can feed on only one or maybe a few plant species. So for example, we all know milkweed butterflies feed on milkweed when they're caterpillars. And the tawny emperor and American snout butterfly larvae feed on hackberries, and that's it. The giant swallowtail caterpillars can feed on a variety of different plants, including plants in the citrus family, uh, rue, money or hop trees, prickly ash. But you'll notice that the pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars only eat pipe vine. Fritillaries, uh, again, some can eat, like the variegated fritillary can eat a variety of uh, different plants, but the gulf fritillary only eats passion flower vines. So you wanna keep that in mind if you wanna attract a certain kind of pollinator to be sure you're providing the food that they need. So let's put in a word also for native plants because the native pollinators have evolved with these native plants and many of them require them for food and may not be able to use anything else. Um, so here's a short list of some of the native plants for Harris County that are going to attract pollinators. And we mentioned uh, some like Lantana, Texas Lantana, um, the various sages. Uh, in the photo, you can see brown-eyed Susan. That's another favorite of the um, native pollinators. And we should say a special word about milkweed because um, it's really important to plant native milkweeds, not the tropical variety. The reason is there's a unicellular parasite called Ophriocystis electroscara. There should be a T in there, uh, which we usually, thankfully, abbreviate as OE. Um, but this uh, parasite harms monarchs and other butterflies. It can be found on any kind of milkweed, including the native species, but it's much worse on the non-native tropical milkweeds that don't have a dormant period. Our native milkweeds will become dormant during the winter. Uh, and as they die back, that helps keep the population of the parasite down. But in a mild winter, the tropical milkweeds still keep growing. And as a result, the population of the parasite can get really high and be more harmful to our um, monarchs and other butterflies. So what you can do if you do have tropical milkweed growing in your garden is to cut it back from about late October through February, sort of uh, create a dormancy. Um, or over time, you may want to pull those out and replace them with native milkweeds. 
In addition to food, of course, you want to make sure there's water for your pollinators. And they are little animals. So it's important to make sure you're providing a shallow dish or a dripper with uh, rocks or pebbles as landing sites so they have a place to perch and reach down to the water without drowning. Of course, we want to make sure we change the water very, very frequently uh, when the mosquitoes are breeding. Um, it's also a good idea to um, have a bare patch in your yard where there's a little bit of mud. Um, as we mentioned, some of the, the ground nesting bees may use that area. Uh, butterflies often puddle. You'll see them on the ground uh, dipping their proboscis down into the soil. Seems kind of strange, but what they're doing is they're getting minerals from the soil. And then as we also mentioned, some bees need mud for nests, like the plasterer bees. You can also provide shelter. If you do have some sort of an artificial habitat, like a bee house, uh, you should be sure to place it in an area that gets morning sun. So it should face the east or southeast. Um, if you have it in an area that gets afternoon sun, it's just much, much too hot. Another thing you can do is to plant in layers. So we already talked about creating vertical layers where you have uh, trees of different heights like uh, ground covers and then annuals and perennials that may be a couple of feet high and then the shrubs and trees. But you also want to plant in layers horizontally. So if you have a garden bed um, that's maybe six, eight, ten feet deep, again, you're going to provide layers by having some plants at the front that might be lower and then as you go towards the back, it might um, they might be higher. And that way the um, the plants in the foreground are going to provide shelter for pollinators that might be towards the back of the bed. I'm gonna give you permission to not be too tidy in your garden. Um, especially avoid the cleanup in fall and leave leaves, twigs, snags, and other material until late spring because hiding down in all of that material, you may have uh, pupae of various insects, you may have eggs, um, there might even be a few live insects that are sheltering down in that material. If you whisk it all away in the fall, they have no place to stay all winter. We mentioned bare ground for the ground nesters. And another thing you could put in your garden is a flat rock or a log for basking. Um, some of the bigger pollinators, like uh, some of the big moths and um, things like bumblebees, have a little bit of trouble warming up to the point that they can take off and fly. So they really like to have a place where they can sit in the sun and bask, warm up. They'll actually shiver uh, to warm up their flight muscles, and then they can take off and fly. Now, we mentioned IPM, Integrated Pest Management. The goal of IPM is to control pest species without reaching for pesticides. So we want to avoid or reduce the use of pesticides, but still um, try to control the pest and keep it at a tolerable level. So the first step is to... Um, really employ a variety of methods, beginning with prevention, best of all, or addressing cultural methods, because many plants get pests when they're stressed out. Maybe they're overwatered or underwatered or um, over fertilized because uh, when they have a lot of new leafy green growth that attracts many pests. Uh, so let's use aphids as an example. Let's say you notice that there are aphids on your plants. By making sure your plants have everything they need, the right amount of water, the right sun, and not over fertilized, you could maybe prevent pests from getting there or um, you could keep them down to a much more tolerable level. Then if uh, that doesn't work, you might use physical or mechanical methods. So with aphids, for example, you could shoot them with a blast of water and knock them off the plant. Um, biological methods might be 
waiting for the natural predators to come by. Um, lacewings, lady beetles, and other predators will help control the pests if you haven't sprayed them into oblivion as well. Then if you still have the pest and there's just too much for you to stand, then you might move on to insecticidal soaps or uh, botanicals, maybe something like uh, horticultural oil. Keep in mind though, they will affect pollinators. So in general, you would wanna use those kinds of materials um, maybe very, very early in the morning or later in the day when the pollinators aren't quite as active. And then finally, if there's just a tremendous problem, um, at that point, you might reach for a pesticide. But keep in mind that as you go through this, uh, we call it the IPM pyramid, um, it's uh, increasing in toxicity. And you may kill the pollinators that you've been trying to attract. So I think you've already received many of these resources um, in the chat or in the, in the live stream. And um, here you can see a number of websites that are great, uh, including the Native Plant Society. There are a couple of um, insect identification sites, uh, Butterfly Gardening in Harris County, Hummingbirds of Houston. And then at the bottom, there's some books that I could recommend as well, if you want to learn more about uh, the various kinds of pollinators. So I'll stop there and see if we have some additional questions. Uh, we do. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, uh, question. First one, I'm going to say, so you mentioned a lot of things about that attract uh, butterfly plants and uh, natives. One of them you mentioned that I had no idea was the hackberry. It was, is there, are you talking about the hackberry tree? Is a, is a butterfly? Uh, really? Um, yeah. Uh, that's for the caterpillars. That's, they're going to eat the leaves. Okay. Cause we've had one. And I, and I know that the hackberry is, I think it's a native, a native plant, but it's a long kind of, I've heard it described as a trash, you know, trash tree. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> They're, they can be quite uh, uh, vigorous. Let's put it that way. I, oh, I know. We've we've had one, and uh, they grow uh, once they get going. I mean, they are uh, they're kind of like the they're kind of like bamboo or something like that. They uh, they grow very fast. Um, uh, uh, we had a question come in about milkweed, uh, uh, native milkweed versus tropical milkweed. Um, any suggestions on how you can tell? The difference between the two and both, like, let's say when you're purchasing, uh, mm -hmm. like, let's say if you go to the store or if you happen to have, you know, you know, you have milkweed and uh, uh, how you might be able to tell the difference between the tropical and the native. Well, when you're at a nursery, um, you should be able to either read the label and find out a, if it's a native milkweed or you could uh, ask the staff uh, to make sure that's what you're getting. Um you, you can uh, check on resources on milkweed to get some photos uh, that may show you some of the differences. Um, also keep in mind that uh, if your plant is going dormant in the winter, it's probably a native milkweed, but if it's still going strong, um, you may have a tropical milkweed. Okay, good. Enough. Yeah, I had no idea there were uh, two different ones. You uh, you mentioned like there obviously there are, there's so many different plants and uh, as far as grouping plants to attract pollinators, I'm wondering let's say if you've kind of got an established yard at this point or you know your kind of your garden's kind of set, is it worth it to bring in maybe just some potted plants, uh, you know, seasonally um, to help out? I know it wouldn't be very many, and it certainly wouldn't be a, a large grouping, but would it would it help out? I mean, does that is it help out to think about seasonal potted plants on in maybe your uh, your yard or your garden? Well, every little bit helps. Uh, you may be keeping a pollinator alive because you have a, a container plant and, and there might not be anything else in the area for it to use for food. Um, so certainly uh, if you have an established yard, containers might be one option. Um, or maybe you can work in a few pollinator plants here and there, maybe to add a little bit of color. Yeah. And as seasonally too, of course, which also I had no idea. I thought, you know, spring was the only season for pollinators. And so the thought of a, uh, uh, 
you know, it, 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 that surprised me. We did have one question come in. Um, somebody was asking about, uh, you were talking about uh, having a mud patch in your yard or, uh, you know, something like, what about the, and I was making jokes about it earlier, but does the type of dirt matter? Is this something like where maybe your if your grass didn't grow, it's, it's okay to leave it like it is, or should you maybe, you know, add in some sort of like a garden soil, at, you know, or, or is there, does it matter what kind of dirt you're is for the patch for the mud? Well, it would depend on the type of pollinator. Uh, butterflies might be landing to get minerals. Okay. Uh, most soils have minerals, so that's not a problem. Um, I don't think the bees are that particular either. Um, clay soil probably is good because okay. uh, it, it holds together. It's it's going to be um, cohesive and good for using um, by the plaster bees or some other kind. Um, the problem is in many of our gardens, everything is, is either covered with plants or it's paved or, uh, or we put mulch on everything. So just having a little bear patch here and there is, is actually a good thing. Yeah, no, I, I never thought about that way, but it is. And you mentioned bees, and this is leading to the last question I think we have right now. Uh, you talked about those bee houses, which I had never seen before having a bee house. First off, where do you get those? Uh, two, have you had any luck with those? And what kind of bees are going to be coming into a, a bee house? That is, uh, I've had a bee house for several years, and I think I got it at Costco, <laughs> of all places. <laughs> okay. um, again, you know, Amazon has everything in the world. Um, you may be able to go to um, a store that provides uh, food for um, birds. They mm -hmm. sometimes will have bee houses as well. Um, so they're, they're pretty common. Um, and um, various kinds of bees may use them. The kinds of, of bees that, um, are, uh, are, that nest in cavities prefer to use those. So you might get something like a mason bee. Um, if they're in the area, um, you might find that leafcutter bees use them. Um, so... They okay. they can be provide a good shelter for various kinds. Okay. Well, all right. Well, one thing I, we definitely want to promote. One thing uh, again, I've got the little information up on the bottom of the screen. The uh, uh, the Genoa Friendship Gardens uh, registration. Uh, uh, anything you you want to say about that coming up? The uh, uh, what people can expect. Well, as I mentioned, this is um, a chance to be a little bit more hands on and see the various kinds of plants that attract pollinators in the garden and um, you will get a lot of really good practical information about growing these plants and best of all you're going to leave with a plant so <laughs> you can't beat that i am going to that. right now i'm going to be i've already put it's there's already a link in this uh i'm going to go ahead and put another one in real quick just so people can have it in there right now and put a link in there for that so that's in the comment section so everybody has access to that um Deborah, once again, uh, this has been uh, this has been amazing and very exciting and very uh, very educational. So uh, uh, thank you so much. I remind everybody we are here um, these uh, excuse me the second the, no wait the third Tuesday of every month. Um, next month we are going to be talking all about fall vegetable gardening, which will be very exciting. Um, and well, don't forget to check out the Harris County Master Gardeners website. And thank you everybody for so much for joining us. Deborah, thank you very much. <laughs> thanks for all your help and thanks for our Master Gardener assistance. And, and thanks everybody for joining us today. All righty. Well, with that said, everybody have a great rest of your day and, uh, and go get some pollinators. <laughs>